All right. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Open for Anti-Racism webinar series. Uh, this is our first um, webinar in the series, um, and the topic is Integrating Anti-Racist Pedagogy into Your Classroom. And we are so glad that you could make it today um, and uh, for this event. And um, we'll talk in just a few minutes about the Open for Anti-Racism project, or a program, I should say, which um, we started just late last fall. And many of you um, have indicated a strong interest in this uh, topic. And so we're just thrilled to have you here today um, and to hear from the speakers. Um, who are um, uh, practitioners and experts in this area. Next slide, please. So um, we'll just give you a quick overview of a few of CCC OER, which is the Community College Consortium for OER, who is working with College of the Canyons on this uh, program. Um, and then uh, James glapa Grosslag, the Dean at College of the Canyons, who's leading that effort, will give you a really quick overview of the OFAR uh, program. And uh, then we will hear from um, Dr. Shauna Brandel and uh, Dr. Alyssa Cooper. And then we'll fill you in a little bit more on the calendar uh, for what the upcoming events are. And we do want to thank- Pardon me, Una, we're not seeing any slides. You are not seeing slides. I am. I, I see the slides too. I'm seeing slides too. Oh, awesome. I see the slides me. as well. Okay. <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to interrupt then. Sorry, James. You're going to have to get your tech people on that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> holy. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> sorry. Um, and I do want to say thank you to the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, who is supporting this program, which is really an exploratory program um, around using OER and open pedagogy um, in your classroom um, to make. Um, to make our uh, colleges uh, more anti-racist. Um, uh, next uh, slide, please. All right, so the Community College Consortium for OER, we have been around since 2007. We were actually founded here in Northern California. And um, we have been working with colleges now around the nation for um, over 10 years on um, expanding adoption of high quality OER, working with faculty and other staff at colleges in order to improve student equity and success. And um, we also have an effort around um, engaging regional OER leadership so that uh, the folks in California can learn from the folks um, in other states. And uh, today's a perfect example of that uh, with our speakers from two different states um, outside of California. And next slide, please, Liz. All right, I'm going to turn this over to uh, James Clapper Grossclang to talk a little bit about our program. Great. Thank you, Una. Welcome, everybody. Glad to be here. So a uh, couple of words about the Open for Anti-Racism program, as you'll see on the screen. Um, this is a formally a one-year program to support faculty in the California Community Colleges to leverage OER and open pedagogy to make their instructional materials and their teaching uh, explicitly anti-racist. Um, the participating faculty are currently uh, completing a, an online facilitated course that uh, introduces them to OER, open pedagogy, and, and anti-racist pedagogy. Uh, the, pro the course will culminate in the participants creating an action plan to implement some changes, some actual changes, this spring term. Uh, so quickly turning their learning into action with live classes and students. And, and the background to this is that, that Una and I and our organizations, we've been deeply involved in open education for, for a long time now. And, and over the years, it's become increasingly apparent or increasingly hard to ignore the blinding whiteness of open education as a field. Uh, and at the same time that that, that was becoming more and more apparent, uh, uh, the, the realization of many people in the United States uh, last summer uh, was raised about uh, the racial injustices that continue to occur in our country. Uh, so, so Un and I, together with our very, uh, very good supporters with uh, the Hewlett Foundation, uh, thought that we would like to find a way for 
people to immediately put to use the affordances of open education uh, so that, uh, you know, in, in open education for a while, we've been talking about the fact that if you uh, take a commercial textbook and you replace it with a free textbook, gosh, that's nice. But if you have a commercial textbook that reinforces white supremacy and patriarchy and you replace that with a free textbook that reinforces white supremacy and patriarchy, you're really not making the change that, that, that I think many of us want to change, want to make. So that's really the genesis of the OFAR program. And we're uh, thrilled to have you here and to have our uh, first speakers with us. So turning it back to you, Una. All right. And just wanted to show you that we have 17 colleges who are involved in this and they're dispersed around the um, the state and um, in future webinars, we'll have a little picture uh, so that you can see where they're located. And you can see that these faculty are in different disciplines ranging from um, career technical ed uh, through um, math and biology and sociology, history, et cetera. So just a really um, great set of very disciplines. So we're so excited to work with them. And um, next up, thank you, Liz. <laughs> I do want to introduce our speakers and get to this um, really important uh the reason why we're here. So first up, I'm going to introduce Dr. Alyssa Cooper. She's an English professor at Glendale Community College in Arizona. She's the former faculty director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, and she's at her college, and she's also the former tri-chair of the Maricopa Millions OER project, which I think many of us have um, cheered on over the years. Um, and this last year, she co-authored the Anti-Racist Discussion Pedagogy Guide. Um, it's published by pack back and it's um, available freely online um, as well. Would you like to say hello, uh, Alyssa? There we go. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to sharing some information with you. Great, great. Thrilled to have you. All right. And next up is Dr. Shauna Brandel. She's a political science professor at Kingsborough Community College um, in CUNY, the City University of New York. She's the lead faculty for OER at Kingsborough, where she's been working on spreading OER awareness in the discipline of political science, as well as evaluating and updating OER materials to be anti-racist. She is the author of It's Not in the Reading, American Government Textbooks, Limited Representation of Historically Marginalized Groups. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, we have Shona. And um, at this point, we are actually going to turn this over to Shauna to start out uh, the presentations. OK, so let me um, put into the chat here my slides. I haven't alt texted my images, so I will do that before you get them. But if you want to um, follow along or click through them or you miss something, so there's the slides for you. Um, but also I can share my screen. And do I, oh, I don't have screen sharing possibilities. Uh, you okay. were just sharing something there. No, I put something in the chat and somebody else shared that. No, that was me. Um, you should be able to, let me stop sharing. Okay, now I can. Okay, perfect. Let's see. And now I have 8,000 tabs open. Sorry. All right. Here we go. So I am really excited. I'm put, just putting on my timer because I need to make sure that I can hear we have time for Dr. Cooper. Uh, so when the buzzer goes, I will be done. Uh, as it is in the playground, so it shall be today. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about, first of all, I'm so excited to be here. I'm really uh, excited and energized at this project, this OFAR project, and especially starting in a community college because I'm a community college professor. I really love what we do. I love the people who do it. Um, and I love that we have, at least in my own university system, we have a little more freedom to actually focus on teaching and teaching materials that's built into our structure a little bit more than it is maybe at the senior colleges. So I'm super excited to see you all here and to be here with you. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, if you haven't noticed, I am a white lady. I'm a native speaker of English. Uh, I am a native New Yorker and I teach at the only community college in Brooklyn where a great deal of my students do not look like me. 
Um, we actually, Kingsborough has the somewhat dubious distinction of having the least representative faculty, um, ethnically and racially diverse faculty in CUNY. We're working on it. Um, a little bit about our students. So uh, from the beginning, and I'm, my, my MA and my PhD are both from CUNY, I've been aware of the financial hardships that my students take. And that's really what got me into open education. Um, first, it's that 69% uh, of KCC students have incomes, household incomes of $30,000 a year or less. And that's in New York City. And that number is from 2016. So we know that it's definitely gotten worse, especially with the pandemic. We just don't have a study to set, uh, set that. Uh, or look at that. Also, 81% of uh, students at Kingsborough are uh, parents. So they're financially responsible. They report being uh, responsible for one or more children. And our racial uh, and ethnic diversity is pretty, pretty mixed, right? So we have 15% Asian American population, 35% Black population, 17% Hispanic, 31% white, and 44% of our students report being born outside of the United States. So it is a really um, diverse group, and I love that in my teaching. It's fantastic. Um, I'm a comparativist, so I teach American government all day long, forever, uh, even though it's not my jam, um, but it is my jam now, uh, and I love to bring in that comparative perspective. So I've always, mixing up what I'm teaching comes a little bit naturally, but revising what the teaching material is did not come naturally to me at all. Uh, I'm the product of two decades of Catholic school and then disciplinary training as a political scientist. So it's been really conservative from a pedagogical point of view. So I'm extremely grateful um, to open education because it has helped open up my pedagogy and now has led me in this direction of evaluating my materials. And the reason I, I share all of this is not so uh, Una and James can be like, why did we, call her to do this, but so that it, it sort of prefer, prefaces this for you, you can do something similar. So as I said, political science books are extremely expensive. Um, and that's really what brought me into this. Uh, and I was sitting at a conference, a political science conference, not an open education conference in 2018, listening to a presentation by Dr. Erin Tolley, who's Canadian, and she was doing a study of representation of minorities and immigrants in Canadian political science textbooks, which was really interesting and automatically, because I was already thinking open ed, I was like, I wonder if she has an open textbook in, in this study. And we started talking and her study was on Canada, but she sent it to me. I said, I bet this would be really interesting to do with uh, American government books. And I, in, in not the best social science, my hypothesis was like OER textbooks are gonna nail this. They're gonna be better because they're just better at everything, right? Um, and well, spoiler alert, they were not, um, but we'll get to that in one second. What was really useful to me though about um, Aaron Tolley's paper, which has now been uh, studied, uh, has now been published or is forthcoming from the journal, International Journal of Canadian Studies. I put this here, this bibliography, because these were all of the studies that I could find that I really built mine. You can tell this, uh, my study on, you can tell that I've been working on this for a while because this slide of the Avengers and Infinity War was a hot and relevant um, picture, right? So we're doing, it's a replication study in a lot of ways. I didn't come up with a new methodology. I used the ones that were in all of these. And some of these studies, they looked at specifically one historically marginalized group or another, um, but they explicitly built on each other's uh, models. And you can also notice, even though the text is pretty small there, they um, all fit on one slide. So there's not been a ton of work done in political science looking at American government textbooks, even though it's the, the bread and butter of our discipline, right? If you teach Ameri if you teach political science, at one point, I almost guarantee that you have taught American government um, because some states even require it by law, right, to be part of a college curriculum in their public institutions but we really haven't looked at what's in those books, particularly here. So I, I looked at, and what was fortunate for me, I do content analysis in my disciplinary research, but I don't do uh, critical race theory. So I don't do that type of analysis, but I was able to build on these excellent studies and, and really appreciate and bring them together and see what they would sort of update them, adding in OER books as well uh, as traditionally published textbooks, doing it more updated because as you can see, um, these studies are a little bit dated even by now. Uh, and unfortunately, the results were not great. So uh, I really thought that the OER textbooks would be much better and they weren't. 
they were terrible, um, but they weren't more terrible than the political science books uh, in general. They were equally terrible. So it really is a political science problem. Uh, and this is an open study. You can go um, and read this. Don't even bother reading the paper because I'll give you the cliff notes on the paper. Check out the studies that it's built on. The bibliography is really, the, I think, the best part of this paper if you're not a political scientist. Um, but looking at this and seeing that there's not a lot of coverage, I, whether you're doing an index search, which was one of the methods that I chose, or an overall just content analysis, a digital um, counting of the word frequencies. The only textbook that did well, you can see there's one sort of outlier here at the top, is McLean and Ta uh, Tauber's book, which is not in print uh, anymore. They're hopefully coming up with a second edition, but this one's a little bit old. Uh, and it is the only book to do well because it's the only book that had a specific focus. So it's American government in black and white that looks at race specifically. And what an interesting lens that is to look at. Um, so you can see here, right? Uh, I circled all of the OER books. They do just about as badly as everyone else. Uh, and this is true. So African-Americans receive the most coverage um, or general generic terms that, that aren't made in reference to any specific group or can be coded to another specific group and then women and then Latinx population. But it's really just an, an abysmally small number um, in terms of the actual coverage. And this is not um, an isolated event, right? So this is uh, the data, if you might imagine, this is the ethnic and racial breakup of political scientists currently registered in the American Political Science Association uh, and by, divided by our subfields. And I will give you three guesses and the winner gets a prize uh, of what you think blue represents in the racial and ethnic uh, breakdowns here. So that's over, political science is an overwhelmingly white discipline and I don't think that's disconnected from these uh, lacks, right? And there's even the um, Oliva study and the Cassis study that are referenced in my study that, that say, hey, you know what? It's statistically likely if you have a person of color who is an author on the book, you're gonna do better on this. If you have women who are the authors on books, you will do better in terms of representation. So that's, those are things to look at. And the reason I'm here um, is, is this really has cracked it open. I was never one for the R, the revise, that, that fifth R, because I'm a traditionalist. I'm a political scientist. That is not part of my training or my experience, but it's not good. And looking at this and having this firm data has been really useful for me to now to say, I need to, this is missing, right? This is not a, a question of, I want to revise it because I need something special special, this is inferior. This is not good enough for my students, right? It doesn't reflect who they are and their experience, but also even if they were all white students, it still wouldn't be good because it doesn't reflect the American experience. And it's supposed to be a, a class in American government. So what do I be doing now? I'm continuing to educate myself, uh, revising my reading list and really refocusing my courses, my international relations course. Now, instead of starting with the canons of theory, it starts with a really great Zvokbo and Loken piece uh, that was in foreign policy about the, the, the race problem in international relations. And it's just a great provocative piece to start with that idea of looking for who's missing. I'm sharing these results as widely as possible. Hello, everyone. Um, especially with my discipline specific uh, settings. APSA doesn't want to hear this, the American Political Science Association, but I'm going to keep telling them in as many different ways as possible and bringing these up and presenting on this in areas. Um, I want to encourage everyone to replicate or experience on these studies or see what's available and replicate in your own fields. Um, if we have psychologists, I would love to see and there I can walk you through my methodology that's super easy to do. Um, and then really getting into that last, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, that's my timer, that's it. Uh, exploring open, getting into that last art to revise and exploring open pedagogy approaches, right? If I want my students to be able to see themselves in their reading, then what better way the chance than to give themselves the chance to write or to revise that material so it does in fact reflect them or reflect the America that we, the American government that they want and need it to be. And then I will stop there. Well, thank you so much, Shauna, for sharing those abysmal statistics. But the good news is that we can do better. Um, and so I'd like to open it up for Q&A.
Well, I'll, I'll kick it off. This is James. Uh, Shauna, thank you. This is it's, it's so it, inspiring and, and it's just a great example of if you want to if you want things to change, you have to be the change, right? Um, I wonder if you could say a few words about your interactions with the American Political Science Association or reactions of fellow political scientists when you've been presenting this in a disciplinary uh, setting? So I think it's um, in political science, again, uh, American Political Science Association is very sort of traditional academic. They think it's weird that I, I've gotten all sorts of shade and side eye for being there as a community college professor, right? Like, oh, what are you doing here? Um, but being in those spaces and saying that this is really important, I was really fortunate to be able to actually publish this in one of our bigger journals and to be able to publish it openly because I had, so now it's probably going to be the most prestigious and most widely read or cited thing I ever write, not because it's the best, although I think it's very good, but because it's open access, right? So lots of people can see it. You can click on that link that's in these slides, or you can just Google my name and the title and you'll find it. Um, APSA has been somewhat open to this. They know that this is a problem for them, right? That they that they have, uh, you can see there's a hashtags like APSA so white, um, because it really very much is. Um, and they're working on that. Uh, it's been interesting to communicate a little bit with OpenStax, right? So I teach with the OpenStax textbook. I love the OpenStax textbook as much as anyone can love a generic intro to American government textbook. Um, and to say to them, like, look, this is, this is a problem and you should be, you know, what are you doing to address it? And I have heard from them some of the steps that they're taking. So they're making their, their um, textbooks available. So anybody wants to revise their textbook, if you go into the, if you're logged into the OpenStax, you can request chapters from them and they will send you a Google Docs version. And I know I talked to Una last week which, uh, and, and we said, yeah, they're supposed to, and I got one, I'm so excited. So that's now available. It may not be available for all of the textbooks, um, but it's coming online for all of the books, which is gonna make it a lot easier. Um, so that's been interesting, but really uh, I've never had a problem. I'm a, a high school theater geek at heart. So people not listening has never really stopped me from talking. Um, so I'll just keep banging on about it. Um, the, uh, so I have a question about, methodology. So um, Voyant would definitely work. Um, very low tech. I did an index search, uh, index pages search in uh, Excel, right, or Google Sheets. So I kept track of that really simply. And there's a big, in the paper has a big methodology appendix because it had a very tiny word limit. So I put everything in the appendix. Um, but you can see exactly how many times different things were said, um, different things were indexed. The index search is a little bit problematic because some of the books, especially the born digital books, don't have an index or they don't spend as much time on their index, um, which makes sense uh, But because people don't use it. But if you're gonna have an index, then be really careful and mindful about it. Um, and then I would also say uh, I used Provalis uh, WordStat, um, but you can definitely use Voyant. Um, the materials are, are pretty widely available. I would not say, I, so I have a, a, a thank there um, or a, th a thank you to one of my colleagues who found PDFs of books for me, which this part's being recorded. So I'm sure he found them not in illegal ways, but um, that's so you can get instead of having to get because ripping it out of a digital library book, uh, digital library or review copy is a little bit hard, but um, Voyant would definitely work, WordStat or any really, um, if you code in Python or R, you could do that. I don't do that because I am lazy and busy and not smart enough, um, but I hope to be able to do that soon. Great, thank you, Shauna, for that. We had a question a little bit earlier on um, from Truth Atkins Martin, and I'm not sure if you addressed that one because I lost my connection there for a moment, but she asked, um, or he, I'm not sure, does this partner with the work that's already out there such as Tyrone and Jaleel Howard's work? I'm not familiar with them. Um, so I'm gonna have to check that out. I, I can't answer that, but I'm, I'm really excited to write that down and, and look that up. Okay, great. Th thank you, Shauna. Um, and there's a few other questions in here. We, we, uh, we have a, a few more minutes at, um, before we switch. Um, how, so Najila asks, how can we make sure that our faculty and staff represent the diversity of our student population? In every higher education institution, you see more than 90% is all white faculty and staff, only 10% 
per 10% minority. Um, and she goes on to say, nobody is listening to that question, question, question mark. So that's a really tough question, right? And it's a different question depending on where you are, right? It's a different question if you're asking that in a community college setting in California or in a, a CUNY community college in New York City, or if you're setting, asking that question in Georgia. Um, so I, I was speaking um, to social scientists in uh, Georgia and they issued their student population because usually when I talk about OER, I talk about income and I talk about race and ethnicity uh, of my student population and that is not the same institution. The University of Georgia is a very different student population and student profile and yet the financial imperative and the, the culturally responsive imperatives are still very much there. Um, there was a great uh, session that I think was recorded at OE Global um, where uh, some some people whose names I will mispronounce, so I will send the link out. I promise I'll send the link. Or Una, if you you remember that session, um, that uh, was was just really interesting because somebody who's a, a a person of color in an a primarily white institution, right? That's a different question, right? If you're so it's a, I don't, and this is something that I teach about, right? This is a political science question when we talk about American government. Um, so I don't have the answer there. I like to look, um, I've really appreciated the, the written in thinking about what, what can you do, right? So very specifically um, written on written, Trisha Matthews, like excellent book about um, the challenges that tenure track faculty of color face that you know, I think everyone who sits on a hiring committee or promotion committee should read that book and just see that because if it's not part of your experience, then it's very easy to see that or to think that it's not real, right? Or to not understand that maybe there's systemic um, bases here. So that's, I, I come from a, a data point of view, um, which is not to say that it's more the, or a, a better or the right one or, or more than any other, but that's just the one that I happen, that happens to resonate the most for me. So looking at that and saying, this can't be individual based, it's systemic. And if it's systemic, then individual solutions are not gonna solve things. We need systemic solutions. So Shauna, there's a lot of questions coming up and we're gonna switch in just a couple of minutes, but I, I one of the, the title of our topic today is um, how you um, integrate anti-racism into your classroom. And, you know, in speaking with you last week and, and you know, previously, um, I know that you have plans to do that in your classroom in collaboration with your students. And so uh, maybe you could speak about that for a few moments before we switch. So, um... I can look at my textbook, right? I can look at the civil rights chapter and say like, this is really limited. Um, and in fact, how come uh, one of the findings from my study was that it, are your mentions of historically marginalized groups siloed in your civil rights chapter in American government? Every American government textbook has that chapter. Um, and in fact, most of their content is, right? So how could this be, um, and I see this being, uh, I, I haven't, I will preface this by saying because this was my plan uh, in March of 2020, right? We have a late spring start, so we start in March. Uh, no students have said that they want to take on revising a chapter. Um, that's one of the optional assignments, but I'm, I'm hoping that now, especially with the Google Docs being a little bit easier, we may have um, some students who are interested in saying, this is what's missing or this is missing, right? Um, we need this perspective. Uh, you know, and I, I really want to see what students are interested in, right? Because we have the second most popular major at our school is criminal justice. Um, and we have a lot of nursing students, right? So there's health disparities, there's um, all sorts of interesting things that students might bring that they are more interested. And that's where the open pedagogy part of it really brings in, right? So we all have our positionalities, we all have the things that we are, you know, have experience or life experience that are, are going to be more relevant for us individually, right? And if my students can use that to, to motivate their research and their work in my class so that it's actually meaningful for them and we can make something that we can share um, that maybe would be helpful or meaningful to others, I think that's that's my goal. We haven't, we haven't got there yet, um, but we'll see what we can do. Well, wonderful, um, Shauna. And we, um, I know that there's, uh, 
members of the OFAR uh, faculty cohort who are looking at uh, making those changes this spring as well. So um, we'll have to all get back together sometime and discuss that further. And there's a lot of great questions in the chat window. I'll let you take a look at those, Shauna. Uh, we'll have some time at the end, but uh, now I want to turn it over to Dr. Alyssa Cooper um, to share with us um, uh, her work. Let me stop sharing, sorry. No, right. right. <laughs> Lively discussion. Okay. All right, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Well, that was a, a, a great starter, Shauna. Thank you. It was very interesting. I kept keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> um, okay, so like Shauna did, I just want to tell you a little bit about who I teach. So I teach at a um, historic, not historically, a predominantly, not predominantly, sorry, a, a Hispanic serving institution, which means we have over 50% of our students who are Hispanic. We only have about 13% uh, African American students. And so the majority of the students that I face each day are white students. And I always like to say when I do presentations like this that I'm not an expert in this area. I don't teach racism or racial justice courses. I teach freshman composition, African-American literature and journalism. So I am an instructor similar to most of you out there who are just trying to do good in the profession that we have chosen. And uh, fortunately for us, we do have the opportunity to do that. Let's see if I can advance my slides should be able to just hit down let's see okay that should work okay so basically what i want to talk about today is this anti-racist pedagogy so the heart and i'm just going to read this one slide i'm not going to read to you all day but the heart of an anti-racist pedagogy is the intent to actively acknowledge and oppose racism in all aspects of a course from the design to the content choices that we make this session will discuss a number of tools and strategies to help build a more inclusive environment in your course, including using discussion to examine and oppose the forces of racism. So I'm gonna to try to do that in less than 20 minutes, and then I will have time at the end for us to answer some questions. So let's start by looking at some of the key areas. First off, you know, we need to talk about why is this important and is it our job? to do this, you know, this is a big issue. The nation is looking at this issue right now and it seems to land in our laps. Is it our job to tackle this? Um, I also wanna briefly talk about the difference between uh, curriculum and pedagogy because a lot of people, a lot of instructors object to taking on this challenge because of this issue of whether we should be changing our curriculum. And I wanna address that. Also, uh, I wanna talk just quickly about uh, the practice of intentional course design can help with the, your anti-racist pedagogy, as well as some strategies for anti-racist pedagogy. Uh, and then the challenges that we all face, whether you are uh, African-American or a black instructor or white, whatever you come to the table with, we all face similar and different challenges. And then I will mention, as Una has mentioned, uh, not just the anti-racist guide that I helped author, but another that I found useful in developing this talk. Okay, so again, why is this important? Well, I think a lot of us, we have to really think about who we are. So for some white teachers who teach primarily white students, they might feel a little hesitant to discuss some of these issues of racism in their courses because they feel like it may not affect them or their students. And so this is the, I, uh, this whole idea that it doesn't affect it, them is a fundamental misunderstanding of what anti-racist work actually is. So anti-racist work, it means acknowledging that racist beliefs and structures are pervasive in all aspects of our lives you know, from education to housing to even climate change. And then we have to actively do work to tear down those beliefs and structure, structures. And that's basically what anti-racism is. So it does affect all of us, regardless of who we are and who we, take, uh, who we teach. Uh, I came across a, a book by Annalise Singh, and I'll put this in the, well, I'll have to do it later, but I'll put it in the 
chat box. Um, but it's called the Racial Healing Handbook. And I, I, I read through that handbook and I found some really interesting information. Um, she says that becoming an anti-racist is always a work in progress and it seldom yields perfection and it differs depending on who you are, right? So you can't look at me and say, oh, she's black, she's anti-racist. That's not the case. We all are racist in some ways, not meaning that that we are a detriment to society, but we all have different levels. And so in this handbook, the Racial Healing Handbook, she suggests that there are different pathways for different people, but that we can all be racist or anti-racist. And so here's the example that she gave. And she says that becoming an anti-racist as a white person, it means taking the responsibility of your power and your and your privilege that you have as a white person and acknowledging the feelings that you have to increased multiculturalism or cultivating a desire for understanding and for growth. So a lot of times we go about our day-to-day -day lives and we don't really think about some of these things, but trying to be an anti-racist means that we do think about these and we cultivate that desire to do better. Um, she also says that becoming an anti-racist as a person of color means recognizing that there are important class differences between people of color. So those of us that are African-American or black, we know that we even within our own race, there's this divide of light skin, black skin, and uh, poor and, and well-to-do, right? And we have to recognize that and acknowledge the feelings that, um, or not acknowledge feelings, but acknowledge that all racial groups are not equal and that are struggling in some way under white supremacy, okay? Realizing that uh, people of color um, are not always united in solidarity and in our fight. So there are many people who aren't out there protest, protesting uh, Black Lives Matters for whatever reason that might be. So we have to acknowledge that we're not all in this together and that we have to learn to address that. And that's all part of our uh, being an anti-racist. Um, so the anti or the uh, racial healing handbook also proposes that all anti-racists must commit to taking individual and collective action, as well as engaging in relationship building beyond our own racialized identity. So we have to learn to work with all kinds of people to, to, with, a, with a common goal in mind. And so as educators, we are in the best position to do that and to provide that education for our students because we, we have them in this audience and we can bring them together to have these types of discussions. So we can't say it's not our job anymore that it is the job, it's, you know, it's my job to teach reading and writing and critical thinking. You know, it, it's my, also my job to create good citizens in this country. So I think that it is important and that it is our job. All right, so let's talk about this issue of, well, do I change, I can't change my curriculum. I have a set curriculum. I don't, I don't have a room or a space to put this. Well, it doesn't, it's not all about changing your curriculum. Okay, so I teach freshman composition and we always have this arg argument amongst all of our composition instructors that some of you might be familiar with. And you know, the goal of our college is that we all want for our students to write well, right? And all of our college courses, but yet in many colleges, students are only asked to take two writing courses and they're only asked to write in our writing courses. Okay, so four years of college and only two writing courses required. And we're wondering, well, where's the help? Where's the support? Why aren't we all teaching this concept if it's so important? And that's the same idea behind uh, teaching anti-racism. We all have our set curriculum we need to teach. And we might argue that we don't have the, have the time to teach anything else, but we don't all have the time. We don't all have to have anti-racist curriculum. All we have to do is have anti-racist pedagogy. And the difference is, is pedagogy is the way in which we teach, the way we address. So when Shauna was talking about the textbook and it not representing all of her students, that's one example of, of changing the pedagogy, changing not just the textbook, but how you even present information can make a difference as well. So there are lots of opportunities for us um, to change what we do in our classrooms. 
All right, so let's first start with just practice intentional course design. And I always tell students, because I worked in, in an area for four years, as Una mentioned, uh, in, uh, as an instructional designer slash technologist, helping faculty design courses. And I always say, we can just start with practicing, uh, or we should also just start with just good teaching, right? If you have good teaching, that's going to cover a lot of the boundaries. And I know many of you are already familiar with the seven principles of good teaching, or I forget what they're called exactly, but quality, designing a quality course utilizes those best practices, practices, and that will help in itself. Uh, just to give you an example, a couple of those seven principles are encourage contact between student and faculty. So if you are working in a course environment where you are engaging with your students, they are getting an opportunity to learn from you. And that is your opportunity to input in part some of that anti-racist knowledge. Um, you want to encourage active learning, okay? Give students opportunities to do things that could bring them to this topic that we need for them to discuss. In Shauna's example, um, having students take on the uh, responsibility of editing a chapter of a textbook that includes more of a representation of the student body. So all of these different principles will help when you are designing your course. If you are doing that, it will make it easier for you to create an anti-racist uh, um, classroom. So in addition to um, following just best practices and course design, um, you might also want to identify what, what um, some people call enduring understandings. So when I look at the competencies for my course, you know, write a good thesis statement, all of this stuff that's just very specific to teaching writing, but there are other things that I want for my students to learn. And I call these enduring understandings. And it's what we hope students will take with them at the end of the class. For me, one of the big ones is just critical thinking. Don't believe everything you find on the internet, right? That's definitely true today. And I do a lot of that in the class where I'm trying to get them to do more critical thinking. So that's one of my enduring understandings. But I also want for them to be respectful of others' views and to understand where other people are coming from and to think before they speak. So if someone says something in the class, I want for them to stop, think about why they might, might, have, might have said that, and then they can respond to that. So we have to not only take into consideration what our enduring understandings will be, but also how we might assess those goals that we've created. We already know how to assess the competencies and goals from, from our uh, syllabus, but how do we assess these new things? How do I assess whether or not somebody is listening or someone is being um, empathetic to a point of view that someone might share, right? These are the things that we are challenged with. So here are some strategies. So an anti-racist classroom, classroom, it should intentionally structure classroom interactions through one or more of these following approaches. So we have to address and welcome challenges. We can't hide from them. I know I always say that sometimes I have on my calendar that we're going to do a certain uh, activity that addresses anti-racism and I'm just not in the mood for it. I, I'm not, I don't feel strong enough to do it. And you do, you kind of have to psych yourself up and be prepared and be ready because challenges are going to pop up. So you have to address them and welcome them. You can't just say, oh, we're not gonna talk about that. Or no, let's, you, you be quiet. And we're not gonna address that today. You can't do that. You really have to address it. Um, you also have to utilize classroom discussions to talk about race. And it can be challenging in different types of, of subject matter courses like math. I don't teach math but it might be a challenge for math teachers to bring up or have a discussion about anti-racism in their classroom with math. Now you math teachers out there might be going, oh, that's easy, I can do that. I don't see it, but in English, I do see it. So you have to figure out how it works for you. We also want to encourage reflexivity and we have to be willing to do that ourselves as, as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of these. And then we want to be able to provide equitable access to course texts and materials. And that's where the OER comes for uh, comes in. So I'll go into a bit more detail of, of these um, strategies uh, with the exception of the equitable access because that's the easy one. 
easy one. Making sure students can access your materials is a given. You can choose OER or affordable text. You can utilize handouts, library resources, provide text reserved in the library. You all can figure out how to get that $200 textbook accessible to your students. And, and it's gonna be different for everyone else. I always like to impart the story about how I've had students who would come, when I used to teach face-to-face, -face, I would have students that would come weekly to, to check out the borrowed textbook and they would sit outside my, my door and read their chapters for the week. Um, and, and you know, you never think about it, but we always say, our students don't buy our textbooks and it's just bad that they don't do that. But we don't really think about why they don't buy our textbooks. And sometimes they just don't have the money. Okay, so here's some of the things, some of the challenges that we might have to address. And this comes from, I uh, found this from some folks at, at Vanderbilt and they did a study and there's a link to that study here. And I'll, I'll share my slides as well, at some, some, somehow. Um, but it says even seasoned educators can be confounded uh, when confronted with student reactions to racial justice, justice content, right? So there's this resistance to learning we always have some microaggressions toward others that pop up and others might even um, exude aggressive comments and behaviors when you're trying to have uh, this discussion. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes I just have to, I have to say, I'm not in the right mindset to do this today and I'm going to change what I have prepared to do. And so these are some of the things that popped up in their study. Uh, let's see if I can read them. So sometimes you'll have to deal with ahistorical and asocial ideologies that racism is a, pro a problem of a few bad individuals. I hear this a lot when we start talking about the Black Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter movement and, we t and police officers. Now, no one is saying that all police officers are bad, but there are a few. And so this argument will come up where that racism, it's only a problem for those few individuals. But if those few individual uh, officers are causing problems for minorities, then that's not good, even if it's just a few, whatever a few means. So we, deal, we have to address that um, as a, a challenge. Also that racism is only relevant of people of color. I brought that one up already. Well, it is, it's relevant for all of us because we all live in this country together. Uh, uh, the post-racial beliefs, racism is a thing of the past. You know, we solved that problem long ago. You know, slavery doesn't exist, civil rights movement, all of that. But yet we still deal with some of these issues today. So we can't really say that if you don't see it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist is what I tell. I tell my students all the time. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean something doesn't exist. All right, and so there are some others here that uh, we have to address and challenge. We can't ignore them. We have to bring, we have to uh, talk about them. And so the microaggressions are the ones that generally um, are the ones that we're faced with dealing with. So uh, anti-racist classrooms should intentionally structure classroom interaction through one or more of the following. And the biggest one is that uh, the discussions that we have, okay? So we have to be prepared when we have these discussions. So we have to use facilitation strategies uh, such as presenting students with facilitation guidelines. When I started doing this, I looked at my facilitation guidelines and, and you'll probably laugh, but my guidelines said things like, Make sure you make your first post by Wednesday of this week and then finish your post by Friday. And if you don't post more than 100 words, you will not earn full credit. And <laughs> all of these things about address your classmates by name and nothing about what the rules should be. And I can't tell you what the rules are because you have to decide based on your audience what those rules are. I try to impart that they should be respectful of each other and to listen and to provide backup and documentation for some of the things that they might say. But when we are um, addressing uh, these uh, discussions in our classroom, one of the things that pop, pop up is that we have to learn to check any microaggressions that come up in these discussions. And a lot of times people don't realize they're doing them. And so I'm gonna show you a list on my next slide uh, uh, a list on my next slide of some examples. And it's interesting because in the examples, I found myself doing some of them as an instructor, but also having them done to me as a person, as a student, as a teacher. And so a lot of times when you 
if you point it out, they're like, oh, I didn't realize I said that, or I didn't realize that it meant that, or that it would cause someone to feel that way. And so we have to learn to recognize them and to check them uh, or call them out and address them. And then we also want to amplify what we call micro affirmations. And those are when students on their own sort of call out something or point out a positive that happens in a discussion. And we wanna make sure that we amplify that. And it shouldn't always be your voice amplifying. You want to encourage and coach students to be the person who does these micro affirmations. So here's the example, and there's a link to, um, uh, there's a good guide about teaching race written from some, uh, nope, that's not what I meant to say. <laughs> um, there's a link to a document that lists some examples of these microaggressions. But I, I pointed out some of the ones that I recognize. And the first one, expecting, st expecting students of any particular group to represent the perspective of others of their race or gender or sexuality in a class discussion or debate. So you're like, all right, we're gonna do this anti-racism discussion today. And then every time a topic comes up, you know, you point at the black student and say, well, what do you, how do you feel about that? You know, and that, that may not be, rep you know, they may not represent what you want to hear at that particular point. So you want to try to avoid those things. Um, we do, we have a lot of heteronormative metaphors and examples in class, you know, a married couple, man and woman married couple and their children. Uh, you use that as a scenario or a case study and um, you've already, sort of excluded any of your students who might not um, accept that type of lifestyle or live that lifestyle. Okay, the one that, that um, I hear, I just read about was with our new vice president, Kamala Harris, and there was a, a senator pronouncing, mispronouncing her name continually even after he had been corrected. So that's one, failing to learn to pronounce or continuing to mispronounce the names of students. I found myself as a, as a culprit of that with my Hispanic students. I would say, how do you say your name? Oh, can we just call you? <laughs> it, that's rude. No, he wants to be called Jesus, right? We're not gonna call him Bill or Jesus because it's easier for us, right? So the this is a list of, and it's not, exclusive. I just picked out some that I could relate to. But we have to learn to recognize those when it happens. And students will start to recognize them as well, but they don't know. We have to teach them how to have these conversations and how to have these discussions. Okay. Uh, one of the things that also is Im important when, with this anti-racist pedagogy is uh, encouraging refle reflexivity. And it starts with you. So modeling reflexivity, you have to interrogate your own experiences of marginalization or privilege and internalize dominance and share these reflections with students um, as an example, right, of, of how to be self-reflective. And it's challenging because as instructors, we don't want our personal lives to be out there, but sometimes it can be useful and we don't have to put it all out there. I mean, I talk about my experience of growing up as a, a, a black student in a, a all white school of nine other black students, right? And when I first got there, there wasn't a day that didn't go by that I didn't hear, oh, do you run track? And unfortunately for me, I was an athlete, but I didn't run track. Who wants to run track? That's boring, running around in circles, right? Or <laughs> I wanted to play basketball, but that's all I ever heard. So I talk about these stories. I bring that up. But I also talk about how I was, I was lucky in that I received a good education. I was in a good school district, and my mom enforced that I, that I uh, went to schools. I like to share with them that I was bust. It, it sort of tells my age when I say that I lived in Ohio and I was bust to an all-white school back in the days of segregation. They're like, how old are you? <laughs> I'm old. All right. So, but anyway, so I do, I model reflexivity, but as, you know, as a writing teacher, I give my students plenty of opportunities to write their own reflections where they are doing their own interrogation of their experiences, whether they are black, white, Hispanic, or any other nationality, right? And this is really important because it really prompts thinking on their part. 
And uh, I'm going to skip to my next slide because I'm running out of time here. Um, so the, these are the guides that Una mentioned the first one that I was uh, helped in creating, but there's also another one that I found from Wheaton College called Becoming an Anti-Racist Educator. And uh, it goes through some really cool things. And uh, this, this slide here is from that from that uh, guide. And it basically walks you through the process of this personal reflection. You know, inter interrogate your position, understand the impact of white supremacy in your work, learn how racism shapes lives. And then even the next step is take action in your role. And it gives you the steps to do those action items. So if you can get that link from my slides and check that out, I think it would be helpful for you. All right, so questions. I only went over by six minutes. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try to see if I can see. Um, sorry, I was muted. Um, you, it was great. Uh, I'm glad you went over, uh, Alyssa. Um, one question that came up, and I don't know that um, we'll have time to address it now, is but how grading plays into um, um, racism. And several folks, uh, recommended various resources that people can use to uh, to uh, read more about that. Did you have any anything in particular you wanted to mention about that, Alyssa, about the grading in the classroom and how that might affect um, students of color? Yeah, you, you know what, that, that's, the, that's one of the hardest things that I've had to deal with because for me, being African-American, I don't want for anyone, I don't want for any of my students to feel as if I'm trying to make things easier for them. And so when I do change grading, and, and what I mean by grading is I change the assessments as a whole. So students can have different types of assessments, and it's not all about one type of assessment. Luckily for me, I don't give tests. So I don't have to worry about how my test is written and what the wording that I use. My assessments are all about discussion, reflecting, and writing. And so in that sense, it's easier for me, but it was a challenge for me to think about how I create my rubrics so that they're worded in a way that encourages students to work harder in a particular area. So I think it's gonna be different for each person. So I'm glad someone was sharing resources. I don't actually have any off the top of my hand to share as far as resources go, but yeah, that, that is going to be important because you really need to think about what you're currently doing and, and think about if there needs to, if you need to have adjustments in that. Great, thank you for that. I We want to just finish off the last few slides and then we will have Q&A with, uh, with Shauna and Al Alyssa again. And um, I wanna hear more, I, Shauna mentioned something about self-grading and ungrading. So um, Liz, did you want to mention um, our upcoming webinars just in case you're putting these on your calendar? Uh, sure. Uh, so our next uh, our next webinar is uh, going to talk about the Math Equity Toolkit from Education Trust. Um, March, we're going to have speakers talking about the African American Male Education and Network Development. April is the Community College uh, Equity Assessment Lab. Uh, May is to be determined. And in June, we'll have the uh, OFOR cohort um, showcase what all the work they've been doing. And uh, you're probably all already registered, but there's a link. Great, Thank, thanks, Liz. So we're looking forward to those. I just wanted to mention if, just a really briefly about the Math Equity Toolkit. Um, so um, Alyssa was talking about math and how it's gonna look a little different from her um, English classes. Um, and so um, we have the opportunity to have um, folks from um, who have developed this pathway to equitable math instruction. Um, join us and talk about uh, the work that they've done and specifically about dismantling racism in mathematics um, instruction. Um, and even though their focus is math, they really feel that this transfers to any discipline. And so I hope that you'll join us for that. Um, and we've got two great speakers. And next slide. <laughs> James, do you wanna mention this? Yeah, real fast, boy, uh, you know, building on Dr. Brandel's observation, uh, OER is not necessarily better in every way, right? Uh, it's a power, powerful message about that. But 
uh, OER and open education does come with an open license and the permission to share and remix. So uh, for those of you who are who would like to learn more about open education OER, here are some awesome resources. Una's organization, Una and Liz's organization, CCC OER, that should be your first stop. The website is just jam packed with resources, uh, years of uh, fantastic webinars uh, archived up there as well as many, many other resources. Also here in California Community Colleges, our, our statewide academic Senate has a fantastic massive project to support faculty in creating open educational resources uh, by discipline. Uh, so you can check out their project there uh, at the link that you see. And then again, the number one resource uh, that you should get involved with if you want to learn more about OER is the, the email list from CCC OER. You can sign up with the link here. Be warned, it is an active email list. So you have to be ready for that, but it is the number one source, uh, certainly in North America, perhaps uh, around the world for uh, colleagues to exchange information about current OER stuff. So onwards. Thanks, Una. <laughs> well, thank you for that, James. Uh, with I would say we're the largest um, network for community colleges specifically. And actually our February uh, webinar, uh, please go to our website. I can't remember what date it is. I think, oh, I think it's the 10th is on inclusive design um, for OER courses. And we will um, have specifically some speakers who have done this in their classroom, who have um, a, a, attempted to make their classes more anti-racist and introduce more diverse uh, curriculum. Um, and that's being led by the amazing Suzanne Joaquim, um, who uh, many of you may know. She's a biology instructor at, at uh, Butte College in Northern California. And now I wanna go back to uh, Q&A. Um, and I, and I wonder, Shauna, if you might mention uh, briefly a little bit about that self-grading and ungrading idea. That seemed really exciting to hear about. So um, sort of my, my experience with open education has been like the, I'm going to sub out my expensive t uh, textbook for a free one, and that was good. But then sort of opening up my pedagogy more and moving a little bit into and just sort of hearing from people who were experimenting with this and, and having really great results like, what is the purpose of the grading? And like, what is the purpose of all of like the rules? Like I, I love Alyssa's, like my, my requirements for posting were like post on this day, make sure you finish by this day. And like, yes, those are, if that's what you want, um, what do I really want from my students, right? What do I want them to know and be able to do at the end of my class? And what do I need to focus on for that? So last year, again, not knowing it was about to be a pandemic, I started working uh, on this and I, I do sort of self grading, right? My students grade themselves. There's a rubric for all of the assignments and it's also choose your own adventure. I've tried to bring in um, a lot of flexibility for students, right? And this is relevant of uh, different economic needs, different class needs, um, first gen versus uh, not first gen um, working students. And then also um, race and ethnicity, right? So everybody needs that flexibility or can benefit from that flexibility. So my students, there's 160 points of stuff that they can do. They can choose what they want to do. And for each thing that they do, there's a rubric and they have to say, or, or a checklist or what it is that they're supposed to do. Uh, and they have to say how well they did or didn't do that and give themselves the points. I reserve, it's modified because I do still have to give grades, right? I have to put something into the the CUNY first, CUNY worst, like, you know, grade receiver. They have to have a, have a final grade for the course. We're not Sarah Lawrence. Um, and it is modified because I do reserve the rights. And I say this up front to say, if I disagree, then we'll have a conversation, right? And, and that conversation has been really great because students have um, revised their work. And what do you want more than that? Where if, if students aren't meeting or aren't doing what you need them to do or want them to be doing, right? That they then do it. What's better than that? Um, and in that, my grades, student grades have also gone up for everyone. And since those grades can be uh, so, it, it's really about, for me, students doing the work, right? If they can do the work, then they should get the grade. And I also abolish deadlines for classes. 
um, uh, for due dates. This will work for me. This will not work for everyone. So I've written a, a little bit about it on my very anemic blog. Um, and I love Alyssa's <laughs> point of like, I can't, I can't tell you what you should do. I can tell you what I have done. Um, but everybody, has, so for me, I blow deadlines all the time, right? It's like the, the one thing, and you know what that has gotten me into? Cause everyone's like, oh, we got to train these students for the real world. And like, I am so bad at deadlines that I've become a tenured professor of political science, <laughs> right? Like, and that's not, I have a lot of privilege that, that makes it okay for, for me to have this problem but how come I can't extend that to my students, especially when I know, right? Like, and I love Alyssa's point of like, sometimes students don't buy the book because they think it's not worth it. Sometimes students don't buy the book because in a choice between childcare or food on the table or that textbook, I'm not telling you that my book is more important, right? Like that's, it's not like I will. And I've, I've said that, and it's been so nice during the pandemic to be able to say when students are saying, oh my gosh, I need another week on this. Or, or can I still submit this? I'm like, yep, yep. I don't need to know why because everybody's got a good reason. And if they don't want to tell you their reason, it might be because they don't know that they can, right? So there's different cultural backgrounds where you wouldn't go to a teacher and say that. Um, it might be because it's something so horrific they don't want to tell you, <laughs> right? Something, you know, a student says that, you know, there's a death in the family or they have to work when they've been assaulted or they've been arrested, right? I don't need students to bleed for me to get basic accommodation. It's just there for everyone. And then it's equitable too. So thank you, Shauna. That, that's great. Well, we are running a little over and I know folks are having to take off. I, um, Alyssa, I wanted to give you a chance if you wanted to respond to anything that was in the chat window, <laughs> that this chat window has been amazing. And, um, and Liz is going to share that with folks um, so that uh, you can, uh, if you didn't get a chance to see that during the event. So uh, Alyssa, don't, don't yeah, I just, you know, sorry for laughing, Sean, I was reading the comments right in a <laughs> serious moment there, but, um, you know, someone made the comment ago, a comment about it wasn't that long ago, and it, and it really wasn't that long ago where we were fighting for civil rights and so forth, but, you know, but our students who are only 18 or 19 years old, that is a long time ago to them, and so we do have to remind them that, yeah, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, I, for me, I find myself trying to explain to students why Black people are so angry right now, right? Because they only see it as one incident, not one, but a few incidents that have happened in different ci cities across the country. They don't see that, you know, less than 10 years ago, it was happening then. And then 20 years ago, it was happening. And then, 30, you know, these years that we've lived in that they haven't lived in yet. So it's important to bring it to their attention that this isn't new. So, but that's all I wanted to say. And um, thanks for listening and um, good luck with your endeavors of, of your anti-racist pedagogy. Thank you so much, um, Alyssa and Shauna. Um, you, uh, you've got a big fan base out there. Um, so thank you, um, really appreciate your time today. And we hope to see the rest of you uh, in another uh, month. Um, thank you for joining us. It's been a great discussion and a great presentation. Anything else, James, from you before we sign off? Nothing else. Just I'm so grateful to, to be here. And boy, some days I love my job. <laughs> this is one of those. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, and see you all soon.